everybody. I'm Allison Bainbridge. I am the host today for our book passage conversation. And I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for your support. Uh, thank you for tuning in to our um, discussions and conversations. Um, it's been, you know, the thing that keeps us going through this last year and a half. So uh, we really appreciate it. And we welcome all of our new viewers. And I'm sure there's many fans out there of Joyce Maynard. Um, I'm so excited to hear this conversation today. Um, I met Joyce a few years ago when she came to talk about a book, Best of Us, which if you haven't read, you must read it. It's just an incredibly touching, insightful look at um, dealing with cancer and the loss of a spouse. And it makes me sort of choked up even to think about it, but it's a beautiful book. Um, it is a nonfiction. Today we're talking about a fiction. Um, and many of us have had challenges, of course, focused on family. Um, as they say, it's a curse and a blessing. Um, Joyce's most recent book, Count the Ways, is a novel focusing on Eleanor, a woman whose life has consisted of challenge upon challenge, both personally and with her family. In her most ambitious novel to date, New York Times bestselling author Joyce May Maynard returns to the themes that are the hallmarks of her most acclaimed work in a mesmerizing story of of a family from the hopeful early days of young marriage to parenthood, divorce, and the costly aftermath that ripples through all their lives. I, I think this line sets up the story very effectively. If you had told Eleanor this would be part of her family story, the child she had thought of as her daughter who had sent her a letter to say that she was actually her son, she might have imagined this as their family's central challenge. Uh, Joyce is 67 now, and in a sense, has come full circle. She returned to Yale University as a student in 2018, and um, she's a junior now. She, uh, after dropping out on the first day of her sophomore year in 1972, back then she left her scholarship and friends behind to move into a cabin in the New Hampshire woods. Joyce is the author, as many of you know, of nine previous novels and five books of nonfiction, as well as the syndicated column, Domestic Affairs. Her best-selling memoir, At Home in the World, has been translated into 16 languages. Her novels, To Die For and Labor Day, were both adapted for film. Joyce currently makes her home in New, York, New Haven, Connecticut. Marissa Silver is going to be talking to Joyce today about Count the Ways. Uh, she has authored seven works of fiction, including the novels Mary Coyne, a New York Times bestseller, Little Nothing, a New York Times editor's mm -hmm. choice, and most recently, The Mysteries. Her short fiction has appeared in The New Yorker and has been included in many publications. She has been the recipient of multiple awards. Marissa teaches currently at the MFA program for writers at Warren Wilson College. So just to, I wanted to let you know, if you have any questions out there, please include them in the chat and our authors will be happy to include them at the end of the event. So thank you again so much for joining us. And now to Joyce and Marissa. Thank you so much. Um, welcome everyone and welcome Joyce. I'm so excited to be here to talk about this really utterly compelling um, new novel that you've written. Um, and I think the first thing um, is you're going to read a little bit for us, which I always love. I love to hear the words and the author's voice. So um, please do that for us. I am. But before I do, I, I just have to say, Marissa, what an honor it is to be having this conversation with you. And um, when I read The Mysteries, and I happen to have a co copy of it right here. Oh, you. <laughs> I wanted to call up, uh, pick up the phone and call. There was so much that I wanted to talk about. So we get to talk. And yeah. um, I, I couldn't have asked for a person, a writer, I would rather have this conversation with. Um, and I also just want to say to the Book Passage community that this, um, this is no longer my hometown bookstore, but it, it was for quite a while when I lived in Mill Valley. And, and so it always feels particularly special to be speaking with you all, although I suspect there are also people tuning in from other places. And I look forward to hearing from you too. So um, I'm not, I love to read out loud. Um, I, I love to read to my children when they were very young. In fact, there's a, a portion of this book that has to do with the, the closest thing to, the, to a, a criminal act that this mother ever engages in, which has to do with the 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 heist of her children's children's books from from the home of her former husband, um, um, 
but I'm not going to spend a lot of time reading today because I just so much want to have the conversation. So this is a very brief passage. Um, I don't think I need to set it up much at all. Um, the, the, the wife, who is the central character in the story, is Eleanor, and her husband, um, with whom she has three children, is Cam. And the year is probably about 1980. We're outnumbered now, Cam had said, laughing after the birth of their son. Eleanor had loved this, loved the way their family, unlike the quietly lonely one in which she was raised, was loud and boisterous and always a little chaotic. She knew from observing the way Cam's parents greeted their son and even their grandchildren on their annual Christmas visit, and again when they pulled down the driveway every August in their Lincoln town car with clubs in the back for Roger's annual game of golf with his son and matching sweaters for each of the children and the same observations every year. Look how you've grown and how's school? But the home in which her husband was raised must have been similarly lacking in warmth. This was what Eleanor had wanted for her life the constant whirl of activity, the small worn bodies tumbling into her lap, the jumble of shoes by the screen door, which swung open and closed all day long as the children headed in and out, and the chorus of their sweet high voices calling out. The three of them piling into the bed after their baths, the smell of baby shampoo, Ursula flinging her arms around Eleanor's neck, Allison, the one who hung back, smoothing her brother's wet curls. Toby twirling his ribbon in his ear, his small foot stroking her own. Why did people think having a tidy home or a quiet one was such a great thing? To Eleanor, the sound of her family's voices was music, even when they drowned out her own, even when they drowned out her husband's. She saw the two of them, herself and Cam, like two white water rafters off on class five waters. You didn't have time to debate your choices or question them once they were made. There was no space to think or even worry. You held on tight, paddled hard and surrendered to the experience, hoping you'd make it to the spot, wherever it was, where you brought your craft into shore, but your heart beat, but your heart beat so hard you thought your chest might explode. First you got wet, first the water swirled around you, tipped you over or came close. You never knew if you'd make it, but you couldn't stop. Eleanor was too consumed with children and work to consider her goals in life. Somebody always needed her. Food, bathroom, shoelaces, lost toys, Barbies, rocks, band-aids, unwanted dresses, volcano dioramas, insects, Legos, popcorn, sorrow, joy again. Come look, come play. An event was not wholly real in her children's lives unless they told her about it, unless she'd borne witness. She knew every inch of their bodies, but seldom gave thought to her own. And though she knew this was not how women should live their lives, devoting themselves solely to the care of babies and children, and particularly the women of her generation who had challenged the old definition of a woman's role, she harbored an almost guilty pleasure concerning her love of caring for her children to the exclusion of her own sideline dream of making art and to the detriment of her marriage probably. Long ago, Eleanor had promised herself she'd never let a son or daughter of hers feel excluded the way she had. Instead, maybe, the one she relegated to last place was her husband. Somewhere along the way, she was losing sight of him. He was losing sight of her, too. Maybe the problem went deeper than that. Maybe she had lost sight of herself. Thank you so much. That is such a fantastic portion to read. I mean, not only is it gorgeously written, but it sort of encompasses almost everything that I want to talk about. But <laughs> oh, in, the, in the forward of your book, you, which is such a wonderful thing, I haven't read a forward, an author's forward in such a long time. And it was such a lovely, uh, I, I mean, I wonder why you, you thought to do that. It's sort of an old fashioned idea in a certain way, but it was wonderful. But you do talk about how you return to certain themes over and over again. Um, family, home, 
um, the ravages of divorce. And um, I wondered why those themes continue to compel you, what in them you haven't figured out for yourself. You know, I, I love the way an artist um, to lesser or greater extent sort of has an idée fixe and, and their, their body of work is about sort of mining and mining that idée fixe and looking for something that they can't quite grasp. But I wonder what that thing is for you. I, I think the themes don't change and I, and I bet being familiar with your work as well, Marissa, if somebody sat down and read it all in one swoop, we'd know a lot of things and we do uh, that carry through. What has changed is me. I'm older. Um, this is not the first novel I've written about a divorce. I, I published one in the 90s called Where Love Goes. And actually, I didn't even know this because I, I don't know about you, but I never reread my old work. So somebody who had read it recently point, and read this book pointed out to me that there are some identical scenes. I don't mean that I copied them. I didn't plagiarize myself. It didn't bother me. Um, the difference is how I see those events. I will say, incidentally, this is quite a new novel, quite a different novel, but, but I, I look so differently now at the struggles that I, I was going through when I was in the middle of those swirling waters, you know? Um, this novel is about a woman who cannot forgive her husband. And I know, I know some things about the bitterness and anger that can follow the, that comes specifically because it, 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 th there was this person that you loved so much and this dream that was so big. And when you lose that, the feelings are large and sometimes violently strong. Um, but from a distance of many years, I could say decades now, um, I, what interests me most is, and I'm speaking of my life, but also in this book, is forgiveness. And so much that seems so important at the moment falls away. Well, I love I love that idea of, of perceiving your set of preoccupations that you need to keep asking the questions because you keep having a different you're a different you answering them. That's a, a beautiful way to think about it. I've never thought about it that way, but I love that. I one of the side things that I do is I, I teach writing uh, on occasion, uh, always memoir. And um, although I've written more fiction than memoir at this point, but I always say to my writing students, write down, keep a notebook of your obsessions. They will fuel, they will be the engine for your best work. And you might think you don't need to because they're your obsessions, your, your <laughs> best work, you know them all too well. But I, I go back to them again and again and they're always rich territory and I do find new things. So tell me what um, inspired this novel. What was the, the first idea that came to you about well, it? Well, anybody who's familiar with my life and incidentally, the people in, the, in, the, um, in Marin County, some of the readers, listening today may have read my old newspaper column, Domestic Affairs. It, it ran in the 80s and part of the 90s, long time ago. It was a column about my family and my life. And I was married then and my marriage fell apart during those years. And if you did read Domestic Affairs, you will, some, some of the things that happen in this woman's life will be familiar. I, I repeat, it's not a, it's, this is not a, a Ramona Clay. It's not a, um, it is not a thinly veiled memoir, but I, my life inspired this book. It's, it's, um, I did myself fall in love in the 1970s with this, you know, sort of big idealistic romantic dream of moving in my case back to New Hampshire to raise my children on a farm um, with their artist husband and both of us to do our work. And the big work was the making of these human beings and the raising of them. Um, and that is true of the characters, Eleanor and Cam too. I, and I, I felt there, it was, I didn't feel I was stealing something in, in, or appropriating something in going to that territory. I wanted to look at it. I wanted to explore it because it occupied such a big central place in my life. Um, so more than any other novel of mine, this one was inspired by my life. And, and then I departed from it and I took pains to make sure that the children were not my children. Um, the woman is not me. The husband is not the man who was the father of my children, is still. 
Um, but of course, as, as I'm sure is true for your work, we are all over our work in, you know, sometimes I mean, in places. Yeah, you're in your work, not only in terms of the material, what happens or, or who the people are, but just in the way you form sentences. I mean, it, all, all work is autobiography to some extent. You know, know, the passage that I was reading at the very brief passage began when I, when I talk about how, you know, keeping a tidy house is overrated. <laughs> I hadn't, I actually have not read that out loud before, but I thought, yeah, that's me. That's how I feel. <laughs> Why spend time? Well, I'm in a place here and I'll, I'll say very quickly, this is not, not my home. <laughs> I will say, I will say though, that in as much as this might be the, the, the book that you use closest to your own life, it, it definitely, there's no mistake. It's fiction. These characters are so fully realized as characters. Um, they occupy that sort of wonderful place that fiction lives, which is not memoir and not, um, it's not reality and it's not fantasy. It's this kind of subliminal place where the characters are and are not real at the same time. Um, and I wanna talk about your incredible facility with characters. Um, I, all, all the members of this family, Eleanor and Cam, the parents and the children, Allison, who becomes Al, Ursula and the youngest boy, Toby, um, they are so, alive on the page, both through their voices, through how Eleanor sees them, and also through the changes that they all undergo. And I wondered whether character comes to you um, right away, whether it's a process of discovery, how that happens for you. Oh, so interesting. Um, and of course, I, uh, I think in particular about how both of us have, have put at the center of our newest novels, children. I love writing children, yeah. and um, and I and I love making children very particular, not sort of generic child. Um, and in the mysteries, or I'll just say to everybody listening, did an extraordinary job of bringing to the page two very different little girls. Um, you know, writing is so lonely, and. I, one of the first thing that thought that comes to mind is when you create characters that you love, you're not alone anymore. Um, I remember this is years and years ago. It was the first year that I no longer had any children at home, 2001. And I, I found myself for reasons I won't go into, I was in Guatemala, but I, the novel that I wrote there was not about Guatemala. I, um, I was just missing my children so much. And I decided to, bring one of them uh, and aspects of another to the page, but it was my son, Charlie, who had, who had just gone off to college, but it was, I, I, I let him be four years old. And I, I, every day was a joy to get up. He wasn't the major character. It was a novel called The Usual Rules, but I got to sort of spend time with Charlie. So I loved spending time. I always love spending time with my characters. They, they don't always behave particularly well. And sometimes they're frustrating and they, 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 I know this sounds odd. I was going to say they make me mad. You think I could control them, but you know what I mean. I'm sure. Yeah. They, um, um, but I, I'm interested in them. I, I, I have good company. So yeah. And did you? But did you know them right away? Did they? I did. I did. I don't know. And I, I'm sure you speak to so many writers, teaching as you do. Um, um, I know writers who say that they plan out an entire novel and they know the last chapter, sentence, maybe even. Um, that's not me. I really never do. What I do know are the, who the characters are. I'm not going to be a writer who, who, you know, discovers on page 200 some crucial piece of information about who that person is. And I have this belief that the character will, will lead me to my story. And it has happened again and again. I, I think about my novel To Die For, which I wrote years ago in the early 90s. Um, and it was inspired very loosely by, by quite um, you know, uh, a, a, a murder case that occupied an enormous amount of public attention at that period, Pamela Smart, who was um, charged with having um, enlisted her 15-year-old her lover to shoot her husband. <clears throat> and I knew that I didn't want to be a journalist on that story. I, um, I was living in New Hampshire. I didn't even, I didn't want to research it, um, but I was fascinated by the boy. What would, what would 
make it possible for a 15 year old boy to shoot a man um, uh, point blank. And I didn't know the answer. And even if I had gotten an interview with that boy in jail, he would not probably have told me. But I believed that if I created the character of a boy, the, the image I always use is Geppetto in the, the Pinocchio movie of our youth, you know, carving a little wooden uh, puppet that is just a wooden puppet, and then the puppet comes to life and starts doing things that Capetto really didn't want him to do and takes on a life of his own, and that's kind of the way parenthood is, but um, that's that feels like my process. So, and lo and behold, so I just had this boy I started to die for, you know, with just letting this boy sort of be on a little league team where he's doing really badly and is father is not there and his mother's really broke and things are really hard and and I slowly let him grow up and lo and behold by page 200 I understood how it was that he could be taking out the gun so that's so beautiful so there what is was there a central question for this book in the same way that you say that the question was how could yes. this, what was the question uh, for you in this book the central question is how do two people who were once so close and are now so far apart, but are bonded together by the children that they share. How do they, how do they make their peace? And for years, I struggled with that, that one personally, as I've said. Um, oddly enough, it was, it was, I was gonna say it was the death of my very good second husband, but I think I, I will say it was living through the slow and painful dying of my second husband that brought me to that place of just letting go of so much. Um, and so, I wanted, I, I remember for many years wanting to not be so angry, but it, it wasn't something I could force on myself. And then I just got to that place and I wanted, and, and I wanted to bring a character to that place. And sometimes when you bring a character to a place, you bring yourself to that place too, and you figure out what the path is to get to that place. Yeah. It was a very rich and satisfying um, endeavor. Well, one, one of the great richnesses, to use your word, in this book is this marriage between Cam and Eleanor. It is so, to the readers, one of the great joys of reading this book is the, um, the, the truth in this marriage, because neither of the characters is the hero, neither is the villain. They are both wildly faulted, even though the book is told primarily from Ele Eleanor's point of view. Um, we see her for the thing, her faults as well. She may not recognize them, and sometimes she does. She has quite an ability to understand herself. But, um, you know, Cam is a, is a guy who's very wrapped up in himself and who um, is willing to not do a lot to take care of his family. Um, so Eleanor picks up the slack and that's the choice that she makes. And, and so it's a kind of a great understanding about how people, um, they, they mold to one another and make choices in order to make things work. And that becomes in some ways who they are. Um, I, I just thought that was so deftly done. And, and you know, when you're looking to take sides and, and say this person's the, the one who broke up the marriage. This is, you know, you really can't in this book because um, you so beautifully describe the ways in which each of the members of the marriage um, creates stress and, uh, and unforgiveness. Um, uh, you know, he's obdurate and stubborn. She's kind of frustrated and angry that she's had to kind of work around that that stubbornness, and yet at the same time, she's made those choices to do that for whatever her reasons are. And I thought you you did that so beautifully and so honestly. Um, you know, that's, once again, Marissa, I think about how how much my my occasional teaching of writing. I, I teach just a few times a year, but but it, it's those were such important times has informed my work and helped me um, personally. I hope I help the writers that I work with. But um, whenever I read a piece of writing in which the character is, the writer is stacking the deck, you know, against the, another character. It's, it, it, it has an almost scent on the page and it doesn't work and it doesn't, it does not accomplish what the writer may have thought it was going to accomplish, which was to, you know, ally the reader with her. Um, I, and I, I really try to never have a villain or a hero in, a heroic figure in in my book certainly this one um as you say it's two very flawed 
individual. But it's, uh, you know, it's, it's an, a special feat uh, as a writer to do that while taking a singular point of view. You know, you're an Eleanor's point of view for the, for the book. And, and yet we um, see her and see Cam with a kind of equal, um, I don't know, what's the word, omniscience, even though it's not an omniscient, you know. And, and point of view is such an interesting thing. You know, I, I, um, I'm not studying writing at Yale. I wanted to do everything but, you know, writing at Yale. But actually, I was, I was listening. I think, it was, I think it was a conversation that you were having with somebody that I listened to on YouTube or somewhere where, in which you were talking about point of view. And I thought, I never study point of view. There are some things I don't know. I, because in the mysteries, you shift point of view. And I, um, I sometimes from chapter to chapter, I will, I have done that in a couple of novels and I, I love writing a child's point of view, but, but in this one, um, I'm not sure, this is an embarrassing confession. I'm not sure that I would have known quite how to do what you did. I, um, I didn't know how to do it until this book. <laughs> You know, <laughs> it, was extraordinary. it was extraordinary. It was maybe I wonder if it has to do with your film background, because it was a it was a rather filmic thing. Um, yeah, I think it's just sort of giving yourself permission to to go off book a little bit. But back to your book, which I appreciate your kind thoughts about the mysteries, but I'm so fascinated by your book. Um, what the other the other thing we talked a, a, a lot about are the children characters and a lot of what this book is about is about the you know the the uh, the way children become themselves through the forces that are exerted on them. I mean, it's not only about um, you know Eleanor becoming herself and finding forgiveness, but it's very much about how the children become who they are, um, both through um, their choices, but also the the uh, pressures exerted on them, which. Are not only in this book um, the you know the un unwinding of a marriage, but also um, some tra a tragedy that happens in the center of this book that concerns the children. So, um, I you know you talk again in the in the forward about you know how you're very concerned about the the effects of divorce on children. Can you talk a little bit about what what sure. you want to uh, explore with that? When I was, I mean, of course, I think most people who divorce. Um, uh, struggle a long time before they, they get to the point of divorcing. And I, I recently, I, I published a, a piece in the New York Times a few weeks ago about uh, some reflections on on divorce. And and somebody wrote and said, you know, oh, this, you know, uh, modern, you know, uh, entitled generation of people who just, you know, something isn't working, throw it away. That was so not who were. And I think it's so so seldom the story of a divorce. Um, I wanted so badly for my children to grow up in the house of two parents, but two par I, 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 um, growing up in the house of two parents who were doing so badly with each other was not what I wanted for them. But during that period that preceded the end, the scene that I write in the book where they, the children are sat down on the couch together, you know, and they, 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 Parent, they think their parents are going to deliver some wonderful news of a new adventure that they're going on, or maybe they're going to get, get goats, and instead it's, you know, we're not going to live together anymore, but, you know, everything will still be fine, we'll still love each other, blah, blah, blah. Um, that was preceded by a few years of torment. And I, I do mention that there was a very specific, there was actually a writer, a very eminent, you know, well-known popular psychologist who was who was on every talk show during that period, and actually was based in Lorain County, who, who set forth this idea that, and I'm simplifying it, of course, but it was terrifying that if you, the children of divorce, she had studied children of divorce, would not only be traumatized at that moment, but that their, their whole path in life would be forever altered and not to the good. You know, that here's this mother, Eleanor in the book, me in life, who would do just about anything, crazy things sometimes, you know, rip her house apart to, you know, find her daughter's lost Barbie shoe. She wants to protect her children. And yet she brings upon them the greatest devastation they've ever known. And what if that includes not just, not just, not only the devastation of when they were little, but that they will not be able to form committed relationships and they'll have, you know, addiction problems or whatever, you know, that, um, it was the most guilt-inducing and terrifying um, vision that, that you could have given to me, presented to me. 
Um, and I don't believe it. Um, I, I believe, actually, I think that one of the things that that suggests is that parents have more power than we really do. Children are the product of many forces. Um, and there are many different ways that children can be hurt. And certainly divorce is one. I never pretend that it's not. And I never pretend that children of divorce aren't different for it. But um, gosh, do we ever lay a lot of guilt on mothers, and mothers in particular, you know? Yeah. Um, um, yeah. And, and I, I think what's sort of beautiful about the book is that the children become who they are. It's really not about ultimately the divorce. It's about them, you know, moving through life and, and being given the, in, the, in some ways, the, the opportunity to become who they are by their parents. Um, uh, you know, Alice and Al. claim or they just claim it. And I salute children who do that too. Yeah, exactly. You know? yeah, like, um, wow. I, I, you mentioned earlier, there's one of the three children, and this is not a spoiler, um, because you learn this very early on, one of the three children um, chooses to transition um, uh, from a female child to male, to male identity. And, and it becomes clear that this child always felt that he was a boy. Um, and the, the, the transition, it's not a book about that. I, I like to populate my books with characters who have all the different stuff going on that happens in life. And I wouldn't really presume to write a book about that because I have not lived that experience, but neither would I have written that if I hadn't known very well a dear friend of one of my children who made such a transition. And during the 90s, when it was you know, a far rarer thing to do and a very brave act. Um, and, and, and he, I consulted with him and his mother um, uh, a fair amount while writing this book. But, but the mother in the book at first experiences this news with a lot of anxiety and and fear and and grief even um, and you I'm sure you know you've encountered this phenomenon the, the sensitivity reader you know the the reader who <laughs> now publishers have checked the book out to make sure that you know the 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 disabilities would be handled well or Latinx issues or whatever it is so there was a um, there 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 was a sensitivity uh, reader for this and and they weighed in uh, that it was transphobic that the mother should experience this event with grief. That was not an appropriate reaction. Well, I don't need to tell you, if every character in every novel behaved in the way that people ideally would behave, we, <laughs> our novels would be very short and not very interesting. Um, what interested me was her growth from her her initial shock at this to recognizing that this was good news. This was a happy story that her daughter finally got to be the person that she wanted to be, which was her son. And some other very hard things happened in their lives as they do, but this was not the truth. You know, that when you talk about that, it's almost as though, you know, you, one thing this book really uh, stunningly portrays is the way in which Children, children not only occupy certain roles in the family, but it really the parents want them to occupy those roles. It, they, they want them to, more so than the children want to almost. You know, we always say, oh, well, she's the nice one. She's the, you know, the, but in fact, I, I feel often it's the parents who kind of rely on those roles because it somehow gives them a sense of control over children who are wildly not controllable in so many different ways. And I think the book, I think Allison and Al's journey is almost a metaphor for that whole thing because it, uh, you know in, in as much as Eleanor wants to hold on to her idea of who her children are the things that happen in this book make it virtually impossible for her to do so and therefore she has to let go as you say forgive you know let life be what life is and nothing more so in this book um tells that story than the central tragedy, which we're gonna circle around because we don't wanna spoil it, but it is a tragedy that um, happens um, and, and affects the children. And, and we've talked about this, both of our books um, contain a tragedy that affects a child. And I wondered how, I, I struggled a lot with writing about that. I wondered how you did, or if you did. 
I, of course I did. I, um, my last novel, Under the Influence, also had a child uh, in, in great danger. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember I was so concerned that I actually um, would say to some people before they read the book, don't worry, no child dies. <laughs> um, I just felt I don't want to torture a reader. Um, and I don't want a reader so filled with anxiety over that, that they will miss other parts of the story. Um, so I won't say what happens, but um, I, at the same time that I don't want to put a reader through pain, I actually believe from my, from my own life that it's experiencing pain that takes us, that frees us from the terror of the pain, you know, that, that if we look square in the eye of it, then we can move forward and we can, we can, there's nothing so terrifying for me, uh, and I know this goes back to my own family story, than the, the, the painful experience that isn't discussed. Mm -hmm. If I name one thing, one part of my life that shaped me as a human being and as a writer, it was that I grew up in an alcoholic family where of two gloriously articulate parents who could talk about uh, politics and religion and art and music and books and sex even. And one thing was never mentioned, which was that my father got drunk every night. Mm -hmm. And that was scarier than my father getting drunk every night. Um, so what I take from that is turn the light on, look at the problem and, and then see how we get through it and how we survive it. Yeah. And I think what you do, you know, you, you, you show us something very painful but you, there is no shock value to it. It is as it is of a piece with what happens in the novel in terms of life taking you in directions that you can't imagine. And you then have to either spend your life living in regret that things aren't the way they were supposed to be, or you open up as Eleanor does and, and Cam. And I, actually it's Cam's great salvation in a certain way as a, as a human. Yes. Um, and I think that's what that allows it to work. I want to ask you a question that's sort of a little bit more general, which is that you've written so many books. And I wondered if fiction means something different to you now than it did at the beginning of your career, if, if, what, if the purpose for writing fiction remains the same or as if it's changed for you? Oh, interesting. I, um, it makes my world bigger. I get to have more lives. That's the first thought that comes to me. One life has never felt like enough. Um, and I go back to this loneliness thing. I think I, I always was, I am a social person, but I'm a solitary person. I've lived alone far more than I've lived with anybody. Um, and so I wanted to bring people in. And, and um, when I write memoir, in both cases, I hold myself to a standard of storytelling and, and writing that is equivalent. But when I write fiction, I get to go to places I've never been. When I write memoir, I go back to places I have been and I, I revisit them and I go deep into them. Um, and then it's a sort of a relief to leave them for a while. You know, the last, the, the, the most recent book that I published was the memoir about finding and losing my very good second husband. Um, after that book, I was really ready to write a novel. Mm -hmm to be in that, that, that fictional yes. space. Um, yes. And another question I have is um, whether uh, the pandemic changed your approach or your thinking about, I know that a lot of us were sort of feeling like, well, with the, the realities of the world so in our faces in such a, you know, kind of unyielding way, it was hard to think about fiction. Um, did you, did the pandemic? Not for me. Not, not for me. And I, I have to say, I acknowledge this would not have been the case if I were a, a parent at home with young children responsible for their, you know, their virtual schooling. I don't think, you know, that was, that would have um, been fertile territory for creative uh, work on the part of the parents. But I actually was in Guatemala on the shores of Lake Atitlan, a place that where I spend um, some time I uh, have spent some time every year for over 20 years hosting a memoir workshop. Um, and I had gone down there for my annual week-long workshop um, just before the world changed. 
And some of the women didn't make it, but eight did. And I wanted to be there for the ones who did. And the world changed during that week. The airport shut down. Eventually, the US Embassy sent a plane. Those women got home. I invited two of them to, who didn't have any particular need to go back home to stay with me. So I lived for six months. I didn't think it would be six months with, with these two young women, less than half my age, um, who were all doing their projects. One was an immigration activist and she created a podcast while we were there. The other was a composer and musician. And we did our thing during the day. I worked really hard on this book. I'd been writing it for three years, but I really, I think of Count the Ways as having come out of that period. And every night I read out loud to the girls. They were the girls to me. Um, so for me, it was actually, I have to say, a gift. It was a wonderful time. It was sad to see it end in a kind of way. I'm speaking just personally. Of course, it was also the pain of the world was all around me, and I was well aware of that. But I, I couldn't do much about that. So I went inside for a while, and it was very, very quiet and very, very peaceful and, and a very inspiring. Very I look back on it with nostalgia. Something quite moving came out of it. So very, very wonderful. Um, I, I think we're about ready for questions. Does, does, should we turn to that? Because I know- Great. That I, mean, I could talk with you forever, Marissa, yeah. and, I, and, and I, I hope well, here's, that- we'll, we'll keep talking, but, but I just don't want to- but, but, but absolutely, yes. I also love to hear from readers. And yeah. so please, uh, please uh, put your questions in the chat um, if you have any right now. That would be a great thing. So Leslie asked- Don't be shy. Great. Leslie. Hi, fellow Yale undergrad. If you feel that your characterization- yeah, Leslie is not 67, yes. <laughs> I wanna ask about that. That was my first question, how's school? Um, anyway, hi fellow Yale undergrad, wondering if you feel that your characterization of divorce is still current and among which social economic groups? Well, I, I wouldn't, Leslie, that's a really good, that's a Yale question. Um, <laughs> I, I don't, I will say that I'm not writing, I didn't try to write a, a book about um, divorce today. I said it very deliberately in times that I know better. And, um, and in fact, for a bunch of reasons, not just about divorce, I, I have tended in my most recent novels to set them back a ways because even though I live now, or I, I will when I return to Yale in the fall, surrounded by young people, and I feel I, I, that is such a gift to have had been able to build friendships with people much younger than my own adult children, I wouldn't presume to say what it feels like to be a five-year-old or a 12-year-old now going through their parents' divorce. I don't set my novels in the present moment. Among other things, I don't want to put technology in my novels. It doesn't feel very fictionally rich to have somebody take out a cell phone and text. Um, and a lot of the dramas that that um, take place in my books uh, wouldn't have been, are not the ones of now. So it's recent past. It's the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s. It's, um, for me, it's my life. For you, it might be history. For you, Leslie. Um, but it's divorce then. Some things probably are eternal. The, and I suspect some things have changed. Well, what you brought up at the very beginning of this conversation about the fact that Eleanor is a is a woman besotted by um, child rearing and the things of family and homemaking at a time that, when, we were, you know, people were, you know, the first wave femi uh, second wave feminism was just, you know, kind of had taken root and and this was certainly not what you were reading about in, you know, the Ms. Magazine on the newsstand. And so there is a certain degree of guilt she feels about something, which I think maybe has changed now. I think that there's a different um, way in which women have reclaimed certain aspects that they may have felt less comfortable claiming at that time. Yeah. Um, time, by the way, in this book is so beautifully handled, a lot of it through the, the smallest details of what kind of toys or what was happening in the news. I love doing that. I love yeah. doing that. But it's so great. I mean, you, you know, if you if you are of a certain age where you did live through this time, there are certain details which are so precisely chosen and they just open up the time entirely. But also I think you use time very beautifully in the way that it connects to the emotional lives. I mean, there's a wonderful um, section about the explosion of the challenger. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about that and how it relates. Sure. I, um, you know, I've always been a, 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 a sort of a student of 
uh, I'll say American studies before I knew it was a study. I'm, um, I, I, my very first, not, not my first essay, but the first essay that sort of brought attention to me, uh, which was published while I was a freshman at Yale, was about the events that shaped me growing up in the 60s. And it was, you know, the Beatles and the Kennedy assassination viewed through the lens of a girl growing up in a small town in New Hampshire. And I still, I, I like to write that way because I love to combine the very small and personal and particular of a story grounded in a family, a home, a town, a place, and the backdrop that we all have shared, the collective experience of something like the Challenger. And the Challenger, the I, that was a very um, resonant event for in for any child growing up during the years that those children did. And I, the child Ursula in the novel becomes absolutely obsessed with Krista McAuliffe and the Challenger. And it comes at a moment when her family has just gone through a very hard tragedy and it, it symbolizes everything hopeful, reach for the stars. And of course, and so children were really set up, you know, to, it wasn't just that it happened, but, but schools sat them down and said, watch this. And we all know what happened. Um, so I, I, I loved being able to fill this novel with all the stuff of American culture and American politics and history and music and that and and American stuff that was going on magazines and um, the death of Princess Diana is there and the Vietnam War of course and um, and the event and and the music that people were listening to. Um, yeah, it's the backdrop of our lives. And the, as you say, that the, the personal is inextricably related to the, I mean, we all read the newspaper every morning. So those thoughts and those ideas are circling yes. around. We live our lives. So let me get back to questions. Susan Hamlin asks, which is harder for you, fiction or memoir? Oh, I don't think of the hardness. I, I mean, it's it should be hard. And they both, I, I, if it's too easy, something's not right. Um, they... Um, they are both just different, different ways for me to tell stories. And I love them both. Um, and, and in both cases, I go to painful places. I do not write memoir about, you know, cute kittens and beautiful rainbows. I go to the hardest experiences of my life. And I, and in fiction, I, I create hard experiences so that I can see how my characters get through them. So as a corollary to that, um, NM asks you, do you ever start writing memoir and switch to fiction or vice versa? Why would you never. switch to the other? Never, never. Um, I, I think a novel is it, it intrinsically a, a work of fiction. And I, I want to know on page one that I have that, that kind of freedom, that kind of latitude. I love writing memoir and I love, I, I write essays too, but if I'm writing a novel, I know I'm writing a novel. Um, I'm going to ask you a question that we talked about um, how we find this impossible to answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Do you read, while you're writing a novel, do you read fiction? And if you do, what are you looking for? I don't. I do not. I, I'm interested. Do you? Um, I, I do read you not, not in terms of novels that are anywhere thematically like my book. I'm reading to look at how authors use certain elements of craft that I'm trying to figure out. So if I might be looking at a book that, you know, has a structure that I'm interested in or, you know. I not remember never... the very first time I ever wrote a novel. I was 27 and I didn't have a clue how to write a novel. I had not studied writing. Um, I had a pretty impressive mother who, you know, wrote with me. I wrote for her, but, but no, I'd never studied. And I really didn't know how to do it. And that time I had just interviewed Anne Beatty, um, whose novel Falling in Place had just been published. I was 27 years old. This was... I don't know, 1970, 1980 probably. And I propped up her book in front of me and I would turn the pages and sort of see, oh, she's writing in the present tense, I'll try that. And But in general, um, no, I, um, I don't read when I write except maybe poetry. I read okay. poetry because I don't want to feel my, I'm very, I'm the kind of person if I was sitting in a room with a person from Texas for, for 20 minutes, I'd start trying to talk with the Texas. <laughs> I would, I, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to pick up your voice or, or somebody else's voice. So I just stay away from it. I listen to a lot of music. That's oh, what okay. I do. 
And I look at photographs the way I know you did, Mary Coyne. Yeah. Um, I, I look at black and white photographs. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I call that the Raymond Carver effect. It's like if you read Raymond yes. Carver, you, you start to write like bad versions of Raymond Carver. And I was going to mention him. Yes, dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, we, please, please put your questions in the chat and I'm going to ask one of mine, which is what surprised you about this book? The ending surprised me. I had no clue what it was going to be about. And as, as I got closer to the ending, I thought, how? Where? Because I'm always looking for some kind of redemption, but it has to be believable too. And I had, I had taken away a lot from these characters. A lot had been lost. And I didn't want to, to leave myself or them or you, the reader, in that place. But I didn't know quite where I was going to take them that wouldn't be just happily ever after unbelievable. Um, so I'll say that number one. It surprised me, some odd little things, like it surprised me that, that Toby was born with webbed feet. I didn't know he was going to be, or one webbed foot. I just kind of, as he was born, oh my goodness, he has a webbed foot. <laughs> it really was kind of like that. I just was looking at his body and there was that, there was that little bit of skin between his toes which was well, wonderful problem. because it, it, he is, seems so much like a magical child in certain ways and even yes. what he goes through in the book there's a certain kind of um i don't know it, it's not magical but it, but there's a you know this book for me was a lot about endurance and how people endure and um you know toby's endurance is perhaps the most heartbreaking but heart swelling endurance to me that that you know there's i wish i could say this in yiddish there is a, a a yiddish expression that i can only say in english which basically is you live long enough everything happens and... <laughs> that's true um here's a question yeah. from robin mencher having read all your books and taking your workshop in guatemala lucky you I thought one of your most in-depth books was Internal Combustion, nonfiction. What is your favorite book that you have written? Uh, and who is your favorite child? I mean, I would never. <laughs> I, it, it's, it, um, I can't choose. Internal Combustion is a really interesting choice. That's a, that was a sort of bizarre anomaly, um, but, um, which I'm proud of. I like that book, but it was a very hard book to write. Um, and I'll never try to write true crime again, I'll say. Um, the book that I've just published feels like a bigger, a bigger task than anything I've taken before. At Home in the World was big in a different way. I had to, I had to confront, you know, this sort of the, you know, wall of uh, disapproval and censure um, for even presuming to tell this story. But this story is the biggest story. It's literally the biggest book I've written. It's 464 pages, and it's, it, it had to be a big book. So. Not a favorite, but this one right now, until the next one, I guess, is the one that occupies a particularly dear place in my heart. Is there a book that you've written that um, when you finished it, you you thought, wow, I didn't know I could do that? Um, I think the first one, Baby Love, because I never had written a novel before. And I wrote it I, I had just interviewed Anne Beattie and I was so excited by the thought, oh, imagine what it'd be like to write a novel. And I was kind of, I was, why am I saying kind of? I was supporting our family as a writer for women's magazines. And I really needed to keep doing that all the time. But I gave myself 10 days to, to, to off from writing a novel, and I, from writing for, the, for Women's Day or Family Circle. And I said, I'm going to write a novel in 10 days. And I, my husband said, okay, I'll go camping. <laughs> and I put my daughter, who was 18 months old, in a lot of daycare. And I stopped, you know, shampooing my hair or cooking or doing anything. And I did finish it in, 18, in those 10 days. I mean, I was drenched in sweat. I just didn't stop. This was a typewriter in my kitchen. And I didn't know I could write a novel. And I, so Baby Love was that. Like, oh my God, I wrote this novel. And... Um, I could never get back into that zone again. It was as if I'd been in a trance. Um, it has a somewhat abrupt ending because the 10 days ended. And <laughs> You've never written a book in 10 days again. 
Uh, Labor Day was close. Labor Day was close. I remember reading that. Um, I think we're coming to the end, but I think you have one reading. I would love to read this very short bit, if I may. Um, I love to read out loud, but it was even more fun talking with you. Um, so here's, here's just a very short passage from Count the Ways. Um, here was what Eleanor had learned over the years since she'd wept over a chicken pox scab on her daughter's scalp and the bald spot it left there, believing that event qualified as a heartbreak. The worst things, the ones that actually got you, were almost never the ones you spent your time worrying about. In all those years, nobody ever fell over the edge of the waterfall onto the rocks. That never happened, but plenty more did. So much else fell apart. So much floated away. So much had been broken. A person can survive a lot, it turned out. Those things change you, but you carry on. She turned her face to the racing water. Even now, in midsummer, it crashed over the rocks. But somewhere, a mile beyond this place, or three miles, or five, beyond the old people sitting in their cars listening to the radio, beyond the men with their fishing poles conferring among themselves on whether the Red Sox had a chance in the playoffs, and the young couples kissing or smoking weed, and the mothers nursing babies, beyond the teenagers daring each other to jump off the rocks, and the ones like Eleanor and Cam, just standing there, taking it all in, all those human beings, figuring out how to live their lives the best they knew, count the ways, or the brook would keep on running, sometimes faster, sometimes slower, but the water never stopped moving. It flowed all the way to the dam in town, and beyond that to the river, which flowed to the ocean, which reached as far as the horizon and even farther than that. That's so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you thank so you, much. Marissa. Thank you so much. And thank you all for tuning in. This thank was you, everyone. This was I and look forward to seeing you in real life. <laughs> yes, all, yes, everyone. <laughs> I want to thank you both so much. Just as I, I knew this would happen, we could sit here all day and listen to you both discuss. And I could listen to Joyce read the book um, for hours and hours. And you all can because she did record her own audio. And if you want to listen to it on audio and still benefit independent bookstores, you can uh, do that through FM, Libro FM. Um, if you need more information about that, you can um, look at our web website, give us a call here at Book Passage, and we'll be able to send you or you can pick up um, a signed copies of Joyce's book, um, Count the Waves. And so we look forward to seeing you guys on your next book tour, um, virtual or in person, hopefully in person. And so thank you both so much for joining us today. And thanks to all of you for joining us for this delightful um, and inspirational conversation. So take care, everybody, and stay safe. Bye.